we actually got some great feedback from when we went, put out the, the question, what do you want to learn? Because we've been sort of thinking about, okay, here are the things that you know, we feel are important, but I think it's also good to have input from members and folks in the community about <coughs> excuse me, what they want to be able to learn when it comes to you know, using Cape Ann TV as a video production resource. And you know, so we've done lighting, we've done how to use the menu in the camera, a bunch of other things. Today we're going to be concentrating on audio, which is one of the things that actually gets a lot of short shrift, I would say. Um, a lot of people are always thinking about, you know, the composing the shot, is the exposure right? What's the color doing here? Um, am I moving the camera too fast or too slow? You know, a lot of that consideration. But the other part of the show is the sound. And I don't know if you, if you saw the promo clip that I did. One of the points that I tried to make was that if your audio is bad, it's going to turn people off. I mean, they may turn off the sound, in which case they'll only get half of what's going on. But at the very least, it's a distraction. You know, if you can't hear what somebody's saying, you can see that it's perfectly exposed, beautifully lit, but the sound sucks. You know, it's going to really mess things up. And the more you start doing this for, you know, audiences, if you more put stuff on the air and things like that, it's something you really should be watching. So I figured it would be a good time to, you know, sort of take the, the response that we got and do something with it. So today we're going to be talking about audio. So one of the main things to figure out is what microphone are you going to use? Because in the end, that's basically what the ears of your situation are. Um, what you can do a lot of times is just, you know, if you're desperate and you didn't bring a microphone with you or something like that, just turn on, you know, the, make sure that the microphone in the front of the video camera is actually working. And if you're close enough to whoever it is you're talking to, you might pick up some decent sound. The problem is, is these microphones are designed to bring in everything. So what I thought we'd start off with is basically, what are the different flavors of microphone? And the thing to look about when you're, when you're thinking about choosing a microphone, you're thinking about, you know, what's the situation I'm going to be in? What kind of environment? Am I going to be in a studio where there's absolutely no other sound except for whoever's talking? Or are you going to be out in the street doing, you know, interviews with traffic and stuff going by? Or are you doing an interview, but maybe you've got more than one person? So these are all considerations that come, come to mind when you start thinking about what you want to use. First thing to know then is like, <clears throat> sort of like the lens on your camera. You know, you either use a telephoto to be able to get stuff that's far away, a wide angle lens to be able to show everything that's in a particular shot, or maybe something in between just to be able to adjust the framing. And with microphones, it's kind of the same trick. Uh, if you look over at number one here, omnidirectional, that's a microphone that picks up everything. And one of the microphones that picks up everything is the lav mic that I'm wearing right here. And it comes, you know, sort of like this. And what it does is it really doesn't care where the sound is coming from. It'll pick up from all around, which is great, you know, if you've got it right next to somebody's mouth, so you can adjust the volume so the only thing it's really hearing is the voice of the person it's only inches away from what this microphone will pick up. So it really doesn't, you know, it's not that sensitive to what side it's on. I mean, it can still be pointed in a more, you know, favorable direction. You can just listen to see what, what that is. But because it basically picks up everything in the 360 degree pattern around what it is that you're shooting, it's what, it's the most useful for if you're going to stick a microphone in someone's face. You know, if you're either using this or you're going to use a hand mic like this, which you've probably seen a thousand, you know, news reporters using. It's the kind of microphone that basically picks up everything, but if you use it close, you can cut out the sound that's around there. And if you stick it, you know, into the interviewer's face, you don't have to pin a microphone on them or have somebody else pointing the microphone at them. It's something that you can do yourself. Second choice is in this in this situation it's a figure eight pattern and it's also 
called bi-directional. And that's because it picks up all the sound that's in front of it, and it picks up all the sound that's in back of it. There aren't a lot of microphones in circulation that are like that now. What they're usually more like is the third pattern, which is the cardioid. And what that is, is it's a design of microphone that picks up a lot of what's in front of it, but almost nothing of what's in back. So that you can really be very directional, excuse me, with what you're trying to record. You can, um, in a lot of cases, something like this, like a shot, this is a shotgun mic. And what it does is, because it only picks up pretty much what's in front of it, it becomes really useful in terms of being able to get rid of the noise that's in back. And also, you can hold it further away from your subject and crank up the volume just a little bit. And because it's canceling out the sound that's on the side and in the back, you get a much clearer recording than you would if you were just sticking an Omni mic into the situation and sucking up you know, all the sound that's in the room. So that said, Omni mics still have a lot of uses. You know, a lot of this you know, information is a lot of people, you know, who use, who are really into microphones are also into recording music. And so the use and how much, how much, what the kind of response the microphone pick, like does it pick up more bass? Does it pick up more treble? Are there frequencies in the middle that it's not picking up? Every single microphone has a different kind of response. And if you work in a recording studio, you get to learn all the different kinds of responses that different microphones have. So say you're putting microphones on a drum kit or something like that. There are certain mics that you'll use for just the bass drum. There are certain mics you'll just use over the cymbals. There are certain mics you'll use near the snare drum because they all pick up different frequencies. And by experimenting with what the best one for, is for the different instruments, you can usually figure out what you want to be able to use. Um, if you're recording, so basically, if you're recording the sound of a room, say you just wanted to be able to hear, you know, a crowd in like, you know, a sports arena or something like that, using a microphone that'll pick up the whole area is just what you want. Um, if you're recording an orchestra and you can't put individual microphones on every single instrument, being able to use a microphone that picks up everything is exactly what you want. And what you can also do is use two of these microphones set up and it's kind of like the way this thing is set up. It's got one microphone pointing this way and another microphone pointing this way. This is called an XY stereo configuration. And you can do the same thing with a couple of, get identical microphones, get you know, like two of these or two semi shotgun mics or something like that and use those on a sort of crossed axis like that, and you'll pick up a stereo sound that'll pick, that's really good. If you, don't, if you aren't careful with using two microphones to try to do that, and they're close together, the frequencies from one will cancel out the frequencies in another, and it'll sound really weird. It'll sound like a telephone connection. You'll wonder what the hell went wrong. That's what happens, is if audio waves collide with each other at a certain, it's like ripples on a pond. You know, you throw a rock into a pond, the ripples go out. If you throw two rocks into a pond, the ripples end up bouncing into each other. In audio, where that happens, sometimes it'll cancel out the frequencies where they're colliding, and you'll not, you won't hear that frequency at all. So if you're going to play around with using two microphones for stereo, get an idea of what kind of response you get in a room, outdoors. In most cases, you probably won't deal with it because it's, you know, it's a lot of work to try to be able to get it right. But if you're recording studio musicians or any kind of thing in a studio where you want to get a real clean stereo sound, that's one way to do it. So you've got, <coughs> you've got something that can only record the front and the back. You've got something that can only record the sides. If you put those two patterns together, that's where you end up with the cardioid pattern, which is canceling out the back and picking up everything that's up in the front. And basically, what they're really good for is if you're in a situation that's not made for recording sound. 
like in a hall, where, in a hall, in you know, just a, in an office room or something like that. And you want to be able to get what people are saying really clean, and you don't want to stick a microphone on them. The cardioid or supercardioid microphone is the one that you want to be able to use. This is a small shotgun. This is a sample of a, you know, sort of a, it's very directional in the front. It almost picks up no sound in the back and it totally cancels out the stuff on the side. But you still need to be able to use this one within a few feet of who's talking. There are other shotgun mics you can rent if you want. This one's designed to be used in situations where you, like say you're doing a news conference and somebody at the podium is talking and they've got a microphone on here, they've got a microphone sitting on the stand. And you want to be able to get whoever's ever asking the questions. I mean, half the time, you know, you listen to, you know, Patriots post-game shows, other things like that, some news conferences. You can't hear what the questions are, which makes whatever the response is at the podium kind of almost senseless because you have no idea. They say, yes, and we try not to do that. You know, you have no idea what the question was that prompted that response. Microphone like this is great because it'll really pick up stuff that's a far distance away, has excellent side cancellation, so it's really like a telephoto lens. Whatever you point the thing at, you can, you know, pretty much just isolate the sound that's like right in front of it. So, that's what we have with that. Now, the drawbacks to using a really directional microphone is if you're pointing the microphone at somebody and they're talking and you just happen to like the microphone's drifting because you're you know looking at writing your level or you're adjusting something else all of a sudden their sound goes away because it's really directional it's like a telephoto lens you're shooting something right here the camera moves just a little bit they're out of frame same thing happens with the microphone and then Another thing that happens is if you use, you use a shotgun mic too close to somebody, what it, the characteristics of the microphone are that it starts picking up more bass frequencies than the treble. So the higher frequencies start to go away and you get this boomy kind of muddy sound if you're too close. So um, it's, it's terrible as a vocal mic, you know, if you're going to shoot a band and you want to be able to get the singer. Make sure you're using one of these, an Omni that's fairly close. Using a shotgun mic on a band is not usually a good thing, unless you've got a really noisy room and it's just an acoustic guitar player or something like that. The other thing to keep in mind is using a lavalier mic. Your problem is with lavalier mics is, you know, most of the time you see it. You know, you've got pinned onto a tie or someone's lapel, or the collar or something. And wouldn't it be great if you could not see it? And the thing about lavalier mics is because they're so small, you can do that. Um, this picture up here shows basically sticking a microphone underneath the uh, lapel, under the collar, pardon me, of a, of a shirt. And when the collar goes down, you can't see the microphone that's in there. The thing to remember is that if the person's moving and you can hear the rustling of their clothes, you're not going to have a, a happy result. So what you need to do is when you're hiding a lavalier mic, either underneath a collar or in between the buttons of a shirt or something like that, make sure that the person, when they move, stretch their hands or do something like that. You're not hearing the clothing go ch -ch 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 -ch. So these are the base, but these are the basics. I mean, there's there are basically three different kinds of microphones. Super Omni for 360, um, really directional for being able to just focus on individual sound. And then there are some microphones that are kind of a combination of the two. In fact, there are some microphones that you either have a little switch on them. So you can go from you know, an omnidirectional pattern to a closed cardioid to a super hypercardioid kind of thing. Uh, I don't think we have one of those mics here, but it's one of, the thing, one of the tools that's available. If you don't know which one to use this way, you always have the right microphone. But 
there are always drawbacks to making it's like a cleaning solution that's great on a car could be absolute disastrous on your stove you know so it's like using the right tool for the job or using the right solution for what it is you want to be able to get is really important so what I thought we'd do is just sort of try out some of these microphones and see what happens so let me switch over our visual aids here Okay, so this little gadget here is the, is the Zoom H4n recorder. And the thing that's really great about this recorder is, if I stand out of the way, um, this is all it does. All it does is record audio. And you don't have to, what it's really good for is if you use um, one of the digital SLR cameras. A lot of time controlling audio when you're shooting with a digital SLR camera is really tough. You know, a lot of times the best thing you can do is just leave it on automatic. Sometimes you can plug a microphone in, but there's a lot of times with digital SLRs, there's no way to be able to monitor the sound. Some of the newer ones have that ability. Some of the newer Sony DSLRs do have that, but in most cases you won't be able to do that. So what a lot of people will do is record audio separately and then put the audio track and the video track together in post-production. You know, so when you edit and either Premiere or Final Cut or something like that. You take your audio track and your picture. And a lot of times, you know, you go back to the old days of film where they would have, you know, a clapstick slate where they would write down what the scene is. Then the two pieces of wood would go together and go smack. And that would be, you know, where the, where the two pieces of wood came together and where you heard the bang on the audio track. That's where in the editing system you kind of line those two up. And then everything would, then the sound will run in sync with the picture for the rest of it. So what you can do a lot of times is just like that, just like hit your hands together so the camera can see where they're coming together and the audio can hear what's going on. So let's see what we can do. Anyone who hasn't used this recorder, try it out sometime. You know, take it out, like I say with all the equipment here at Cape Ann TV, take it out, experiment with it, see what it does. One of the things that's amazing, and I'll get into this later, is the microphones that are mounted on the top here are unbelievably good quality. So a lot of times, if you want to record like, you know, musical ensemble or some, you know, a pianist or something like that, and you want to be able to just sort of get all the sound and you want to get it in nice, clean stereo, these microphones do a great job. So after you've turned the thing on, you basically hit this record button. And what the record button does is it's not actually recording. You see the VU meter here. It's, it's showing you, you know, basically how loud this is. This is going from this cable into the bottom of this. And there are two settings over here, one that says microphone and the other ones that are one, two. If you hit this, this is, pardon me, this is just the inside microphones here. And if you hit these buttons down here, that goes into the external. There's a left and a right. There's a way you can set this up so you can be using both the left and the right XLR inputs and the two microphones on the top. So you can, in, you can in effect, have a four-channel recording going on, which gives you a lot of flexibility. What you can't do is control the audio levels individually. You can't control these microphones separately from this. So you basically are going to be trapped into using whatever the loudest signal is. You've got to turn it down so that's the one that it's all set for. And you hope that everything else is kind of the same. But if you're just going to be recording on two channels, which is a lot of what you do with you know, a video camera, is you record either on the left channel or the right channel, either one or two, same thing happens here. You have that same kind of ability. So, um, again, you know, if I've got the microphone down here, I'm not going to hear much. If I've got the microphone up by my face, you're going to hear more. And 
that kind of shows you what you can do with the Omni hand mic. So, Hello everyone, this is Peter Stone. I wanted to welcome you. So, unless you wipe with the card, this, this thing will, this has got like a 16 gigabyte card in it, which is good for something like two days worth of constant recording. So you can just start this thing off and as long as the battery doesn't die on you, it'll just keep on recording audio. So, this is one way to be able to uh, kind of get an idea of what the different microphones will do. Then, no, I don't think I turned the phantom power on here. Everything's in the menu. And you can see there are all these adjustments that you can get into. Oh, one of the things that you could also do is say you've only got one microphone going in here. You can turn on the mono mix feature and you'll get the signal on both channel one and channel two in case you don't want to in post have to get rid of one of the channels, which sometimes you do. So everybody know about phantom power? Phantom power is when you've got a microphone that needs to have external power to be able to make it work. This microphone here has a little on off switch so you can, it's got a battery built into it. When you turn it on, the red light goes on. You turn it off, it goes off. So it's self-powered. And these dynamic mics, like this one, don't need any power. Because what you're doing is the, the electromagnetic current that's created with the capsule here goes directly into the recorder. All right, so now, but phantom power is basically a way to be able to power the microphone right through the microphone cable. And there's a switch for that also on the audio input on your camera. So if you're using a microphone that needs external power, which some of them do, or you're using this and the, mic and the battery dies, you can switch over to phantom power and power the microphone that way. So let's turn on the phantom power. Kill the menu. So, now here's the thing, you know, you put the microphone back here, it's still going to pick up my voice. So, you know, you don't have to have it right up by your face, you can have it way the heck out here. And what it'll do is it'll, again, it's canceling out a lot of the sound that's coming in back of it, like you turn it around it'll feed back because it can hear itself. But in the same position, you can see it's canceling out the sound that's coming out of the back so that you don't get either the feedback if you've got you know, it going on a PA system, which in most cases you wouldn't use something like this on a PA system. You'd use the vocal mic to you know, have something close by so you can crank up the speakers and the microphone still won't pick it up. But when you're recording in the field, you want to be able to have a microphone that's not in the shot, which means you want to be able to keep it at least a couple of feet away from whoever it is you're filming. Is the gain adjustable? Yes, it is. There's a little, um, there's a lever on the side here that says audio level. Which if you look here, that's the, there's a record level adjustment on this side. And then there's a monitor level for your headphones here. So between the two of them, you can have 
you know, quite a bit of control over how much is coming through your headphones, what kind of level you're getting through the microphone. Now, two ways to be able to use the shotgun mic. If you try to use it just like this, sometimes it'll pick up the sound of your hand. And it's usually always during the most important part of the interview or whatever is going on. So that's, you know, a one way to be able to make sure that doesn't happen is to use a shock mount pistol grip like this. And what this makes it possible, I put it on backwards, sorry. So what you want, this way you can, you know, just sort of operate like this, put the, the cord up here. It's got like a couple little things inside here that will keep the cord from moving around. And this way you can, you know, either come up from underneath whoever's talking, and as long as it's out of frame, you won't see it, or you can come in like this. And this is one way to, if you're doing a real, you know, sort of run and gun kind of thing, you're at some public event, and you want to be able to microphone people, but you don't have time to stick a lavalier mic on everybody, what you can do is put a lav mic on whoever it is that's doing the interview, and then have this to be able to pick up whoever it is you're talking to. So this is one way to be able to, to use the shotgun mic. The other way is what is called a fish pole, appropriate for Gloucester. And what this does, this is kind of a combination of tools here. You've probably seen these on the location of, you know, a lot of, a lot of feature films. This is sort of the standard way of getting audio. Lavalier mics are, are a great thing if you only got one person, but if you've ever done theater and you know if you've got like, you know, maybe six people with lavalier mics, one of them goes bad and you're in trouble. So feature films will still use, you know, lav mics if you're in a situation where there's a lot of noise. The um, TV show Wicked Tuna puts lav mics on every single person on the boat and they record everything onto a separate channel on a multi-track recording machine. They got an eight track and everybody's got a microphone on them so that when the engine's roaring or the wind is blowing or stuff like that, you can isolate just whoever it is that's talking in the final mix, which gives you a lot of flexibility. But it also keeps the sound guy really busy, you know, because you got to be able to watch all the different levels, you got to make sure all of the microphones are working. So one of the ways around that is to have a microphone on the end of one of these sticks And this particular, KPAN TV has one of these, but it doesn't have, this one's got an internal wiring so that you can plug the microphone in with this wire, which runs all the way down the pole and up through, and then you plug in your connector down here. So you can extend this thing quite a ways. So you've got, you know, a really long, you know, way to be able to get the microphone in on somebody. Now, what, you know, a lot of folks try to do is because it's less fatiguing is, you know, sort of hold the microphone like this. The problem is all of this part of the pole could get in the shot. You know, if you're moving the thing around, you're going to see it. So the best way to be able to hold a fish pole is to like this. So you've got your hands over your head. This way, no part of the pole gets into the shot. Of course, if you've got a long shotgun microphone like this, you're going to end up with maybe it getting in the shot. So maybe you don't need as directional, as long a shotgun mic as that. So you just use a shorter one. You've still got some directional pickup, but it's not, it's not going to end up getting in the shot. Now, the other thing is if the person you're miking isn't moving around, and you have a big light stand available, there's a little connect, there's a uh, adapter shoe here. And what you can do is put your pole on that, make sure you have a sandbag on one of the legs so it doesn't go tipping over. And you can, you know, basically use that 
as your interview microphone, which in some cases is a much more realistic way of being able to record voice or other sounds. But you don't have the proximity. What happens is when you're, it's always different. You know, if you, if you stand right next to somebody when they're talking, they sound totally different than if you're standing like about four or five feet back. So what's the quality you want to get? If it's like a, a really intimate scene where somebody is talking about a big secret or something like that, a live mic, you know, close to the mouth is probably pretty good. But if you just want to have a normal conversation, you have to have, you have got to make sure that this thing is not adding some kind of extra frequencies to what you're doing. Everything's a compromise. There's strengths to the lav mic and there are weaknesses. There's strengths to the shotgun mic, but there are also weaknesses. And the way you find out about those things is to really, you know, experiment, try it out and see how it works for you. So next thing I wanted to do is just sort of open up the floor to questions, whatever you want to know about what we've been talking about so far. Yes? Not directly, but I'm still confused about the foam thing you put over the microphone. The windscreen. It's, it's essential in a lot of cases. If you use, especially if you're using an Omni microphone outside, it's got so many different directions that the wind can hit it. You want to be able to, you know, keep it from happening. What happens when you put the foam over it, the wind hits this and it's basically pushed out in different directions so it doesn't go right into the cartridge that is actually picking up the, the audio frequencies. So what it will do is it will cut off some of the high frequencies you've got, but if you're recording voice, it's not that bad. And in post-production, you can kind of boost the high frequencies if you want to to get something that's a little more accurate. But wind will kill your shot. The uh, problem with using this microphone here on the camera, there's no windscreen. So if you're talking to somebody and the wind happens to hit the microphone, whatever they're saying is gone. With a lav mic, you can get, and I've seen some of these with windscreens on them. And you can that way, you know, kind of, you can, you know, shield the thing from the, the hurricane. So you really only use it for the wind. That's it. Or if you're, like, if you're, if you're singing or something like that, and you're holding the microphone really close, if you, you know, the word P, or T or something like that, that there's a little burst of air that comes out that, that'll make the microphone pop if you don't have the windscreen on it. If you have the windscreen on it, then it'll minimize that. It won't eliminate it. Best thing for vocals, I don't know if you've, a lot of times when you're recording in a studio, a pop screen is like this sort of circular thing. It's either got a piece of screen in it or um, pantyhose or something else in there. And what it does is it, cuts down on the blasts of air, but it doesn't get in the way of the audio frequency, you know, the, the actual sound that's coming through it. So use a windscreen when you're in the wind. If you're indoors and you have no wind, then get rid of it. Well, continuing on that theme, how, how about the, the shaggy reversion? Oh, those things, the, those furry things? Those, those things work great. I mean, um, uh, I was shooting on a fishing boat once, and we were doing like maybe about 15 knots, and the wind was also blowing and stuff. But well, because I had one of these, you know, furry thing, what it does is it, the microphone goes in a thing called a zeppelin. It's like this sort of um, cage that the microphone's in. Sometimes you can get one of these that, with, that just slips onto the microphone. And what it is, it's a cage, and it's got like really plush kind of thing. Yeah, it looks like a furry kitty. I had a sound guy once that put like little felt eyes on the thing, you know, so you could stick the microphone in people's face and it has this, these eyes looking back at you. But it does look like, you know, some, a cat on a stick. But it works great, you know, in terms of being able to get rid of almost any, I mean, you, if it's a blowing, if it's like 40 mile an hour winds or something like that, it, it may not help you out. But in most windy conditions, it does a great job. Again, do they I mean, they're band class as well, so they're going to knock out some. Yeah, they do. They do. The, everything you put on a microphone is going to cut out some frequencies. And what they do is with the furry things, they designed it so that it has, you know, they find the, the sweet spot where it's cutting out the wind to the maximum effect, but it's also not interfering with the audio frequency. So you end up with good audio without 
big blast so of wind. You, you kind of want to have a, an ear open, so to speak, yeah. to the filter being appropriate for the brand or the model of microphone and right. the uses of them for yeah. compensation. Like exactly. That. And you want to make sure it fits. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah. But you also want to make sure that the character, they, people who design these, these windscreens design them for specific microphones. So the materials, the construction, the dimensions, and all of that do the least to color the uh, sound that you're actually recording. One thing I might also add is if you're trying to record audio with, um, you know, with the D DSLR, what a lot of times they'll do is they'll build the microphone like in a, in a little hole that's like right next to the lens. So if you've got an autofocus lens on your digital SLR, you'll hear the servo motors every time the thing you know, focuses one way or the other. Or if it's looking for a focus, you'll hear the thing going, zzz, 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 you know, which will totally mess things up, which makes it really unsatisfactory as an audio recording tool. Getting a microphone that you can stick on top of the camera and then plug it into the side like you would on something like this will help. But again, until digital SLRs get to the point where they say, yeah, we should put in more of, you know, audio controls, you're still going to be you know, struggling, which is why recording on a separate recorder is really still the best way to do that. You get great pictures, and this way you'll get great sound too. Anybody else? Ah, yes. <coughs> um, say you're talking to, say, say you're going to a, a public speech, like at City Hall or something like that, and the audio is usually fed into a PA system. Um, at concerts, what they will do is have a separate mixing board. They'll use the same microphones as going out to the PA system, but you'll use, they'll use a totally separate mixing board because whatever makes a good mix for the hall could be a terrible mix for, for recording. So if you've got the time, you've got the budget, all the microphones should go through splitters and then off to a separate mixer for you for your video recording. If you can't do that, and if it's just one microphone, somebody at a, at a podium or something like that, most mixers have an output. Do, you, do we still have that Shure mixer that you showed me? Maybe now would be a good time to dig it out. We probably should have dug it out before, but... What's good to be able to do is, and I didn't get into this that much, is if you've got more than one microphone and you only have two inputs, what do you do? You have to be able to find a way to be able to get all of these sounds together into one or two sources. And the best thing for doing that is a audio mixer, right? Um, <laughs> they come in all different kinds of sizes and shapes. You know, if you look in the um, control room here, there's a big audio board it's got like 24 inputs, and you can control each one of them separately and flavor each one of them. This, this is the old standby, a Shure M267. These have been around since day one. And if you look at the, you know, the front, it's pretty simple. It's got individual volume controls for every one of the outputs, and then you've got a master level for this. Okay, so you've got... There is a low cut filter. Here's the mas this is the master control. And it's got a limiter. So that in, in case you, know, you get a big fat peak going in there, it'll, it'll cut that down. Here there's sort of limited equalization. It's a... Um, It'll, it's basically a low cut filter. So if you've got somebody mic'd close and they're boomy, just turn on the low cut and that'll get rid of the lower frequencies that are going through it. So you've got, you got one input that doesn't work, but you got three others, right? And then, oh, this, this one is just busted. yeah, that one's just busted. And it's got one output that goes to the camera. In fact, it even says from PA, to camera. And what you can do here is you've got a choice between two different levels. If you've got a microphone, you can go right into here 
or if the output from the mixing board or the microphone on the podium that you're using is not amplified, use it on mic level. If, however, you're coming out of another mixer, you know, somebody's got a mixer like this and they're already controlling stuff and you just want to be able to get a signal out of that, um, then you switch over to line. So the two, I mean, what that does is it cuts down the, the strength of the signal coming into the mixer so it doesn't overmodulate. So it don't, you don't get that <coughs> distortion that you get when you try to force too much sound down the pipeline. This is um, basically, you know, a simple mono mixer. You can only, you know, this will only record one, this will only be good for one channel. If you got two of them, then you can control the stuff that's going into one channel, and control the stuff that's going into another channel. You still only, you know, it still mixes it down to two, to two signals, you know, a, a left or a right. So this would be either the left mixer or the right mixer. And once you've recorded like that, you can't take the tracks apart. You know, whatever you recorded on that one, whatever these three microphone inputs did to that one, piece, well, that one signal, you're stuck with that. That's, you know, sort of pre-mixed. But, you know, if you happen to have a multi-track recorder, then you can just feed all of your microphones into individual inputs. But this is really good in case you've got, like, a bunch of people sitting around the table you got four people, you want to put like four lav you know, lavalier mic on each person. This way what you can do is like, you know, sort of turn it down to zero, kill the microphone of whoever isn't talking, and then bring it back up again when they are talking. So that way you don't get a lot of, you know, coughing and paper shuffling and stuff like that. A mixer, a lot of times, you know, if you've got more than one person talking, a mixer is an excellent thing to bring along with you, just to be able to make sure that, you know, you can hear everybody. There's nothing, nothing's worse than, you know, recording a meeting where you got people talking and only half of them you can hear. So, and again, this is tough to do all by yourself. You know, if you're out there, you know, like doing a one-man band thing, it's, it's not easy to be able to make all this stuff work. But, you know, it's because it's a lot to be on top of, which is why, you know, an audio technician usually is, you know, if you're only going to do, do a two-person crew, an audio person is the best use of that second person, you know. Um, if you're trying to do it all by yourself, um, you got to be really familiar with all the equipment, really know how the microphones are working, know what to listen for when the battery's dying on a lav mic or shotgun mic or something like that. And that way you can, you know, come back with something you can see and hear well. Any other questions? The world of audio is ever expanding. One of the things that it's interesting is the microphones haven't changed a lot in the last five years, but there are new advances coming now that are going to make it possible for, in case you've got a group talking, there's a near field microphone which actually fits on a table or a conference table. And what it will do is it'll pick up just voice frequencies, but it'll cut out all the other frequencies around. So it's one of the better ways to be able to do it. I mean, if you've seen the microphones that are in, um, uh, you know, if you're doing a conference call and there's, you know, a little box on the, on the meeting table and it tries to pick up everybody who's there. Um, sometimes that works out really lousy, but the, the new versions of that are also available in microphones you can plug into the camera. Yeah, a lot of them are voice activated, so you wind up having to preface everything you say. Uh, Right. Or you say your name, yeah, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, and it'll it'll come to life. But um, these things are built like tanks. You know, it's really tough to kill them. So it's it's a good thing to be able to. I mean, it's you know extra weight to carry around with you. But a lot of times it can really you know save the production if you've got a way to be able to mix audio together. Oh, um, one last one. Um, I, I suspect that these are. Just modifications of lab, uh, little, uh, little mini headsets. Yes. And, uh, That's the other thing that um, absolutely baffles me sometimes, well, is I see people out recording stuff, and they're not wearing these. Yeah. How the heck do you know what you're getting if you're not listening, you know? But a lot of times people just, like, you know, put the audio in automatic. And as long as they see, you know, the bars bouncing around they figure okay I'm getting sound 
you know, you may be getting terrible sound, but you won't know unless you have this on. So it's another way to be able to do it. Um, in a pinch, earbuds work just as well. Um, so you get an idea of at least, am I, is the microphone working? Is it too loud? Is it too soft? It's a terrible way. I mean, earbuds are not great in terms of being able to, you know, listen to audio quality, especially in the field because there's no cancellation. These do a pretty good job because when you put your, they've got, you know, a little bit of padding there. So you will, it will cut out a lot of the external sounds. So you're getting more through here and you got a truer idea of what you're actually recording. And then there are others that have these giant, they're almost like studio headsets where you've got, you know, big padding around the ear things, which totally shuts out everything in the outside world. And it's the closest thing to being able to record in a studio in the field. So, yeah, these are absolutely, I should not have forgotten about that. These are, you know, next to, the, next to whatever microphone you're using, having one of these, make sure you use them. Anything else? I have a question about that phantom. Yes, yes. So when you've got that setting activated, you're saying, as I understood you, you mean that the microphone itself is, is not powered, but it is responding? No, the microphone is powered. That's basically the way microphones work is there's a little, you know, there's a, there's a capsule in here with a diaphragm. And as you talk into it, the diaphragm vibrates and sends those vibrations into whatever cartridge here is picking up, is, is taking those vibrations and turning them into electro sig electromagnetic sig signals. Mm -hmm. So the, the, elect the electronic signal that comes out of this microphone doesn't need any auxiliary power to make it work. But with this microphone, it's much more sensitive. It's got a much larger sensing cartridge in it. In fact, it's a ribbon that goes the whole length of the, the microphone here. It needs to be powered because the energy of sound hitting it is not enough to be able to send a powerful enough signal off to your recorder. So that's why you have to power these things. Sometimes um, there was a time when you had to have a separate power supply. You would plug the microphone into the power supply and then plug the camera into the power supply. The power supply was yet another box that you had to carry around with you. Then as soon as they figured out ways to be able to, you know, put a, um, put a battery inside the microphone, that helped a lot. And then as enough of these microphones were available, uh, in mixers and cameras and things like that, uh, they provided for phantom power so that either a 48 or a 24 volt DC you know, power source was basically going into the microphone so that it would actually work. Conventional telephone, you know, your house phone, that's a phantom powered on forty five. And the really, really early ones were not. They oh, were they, they were totally not powered. What there were there was like um, you know, carbon powder inside a cartridge, and as you talked into the diaphragm, it would, you know, hit the car the carbon part, you know, particles, and that would create electricity, which would go out on the wire. This is like years. Yeah, this is a very long time ago, but these work exactly practically the same way. You know, it's it's creating its own electric signal, whereas this is creating a very faint electric signal, which has to be amplified. So essentially, what it's got in here is a tiny amplifier that, when the 48 volts hits that activates at the preamp, and then you can hear what's coming out of that. And that's a AA battery, right? Yes. And you switch it on. And you switch it on. Or you activate, if you look at the cameras here, there is a, there's a, um, a switch for plus 48 volts. And that's the phantom power for that particular output on that. So if you've got a, if you've got a microphone that doesn't have a built-in battery, that's how to make it work. If the battery dies on yours or you don't feel like killing the battery, just leave it switched off and use the phantom power that comes out of the camera. Of the two variants on phantom, is, is the 24 volt or the 48 much more common than the other? The 48 is more common. In fact, this one only doesn't give you the option. The phantom power is only 48 volts on that. Some microphones are only 24 volt. You won't kill it if you put 48 through it, but it just won't work. So. Know, know what kind of voltage your phantom power needs. Are they typically marked? 
yeah, they'll sometimes, well, I would say, yeah, but sometimes they aren't. You know, sometimes they'll say phantom power 48 volts. Sometimes they'll just say phantom power. Sometimes it won't at all. It won't give you a clue as to, you know, what it is that's going on. The other thing to know about when you're using a microphone, I don't know if you can see this, but this has got, you can cut off, sometimes it's just a switch on the thing, that you can cut off the low frequencies. That's what this is. The left side of, you know, here you've got a line just which is flat, you know, flat response. And over here, because it's got a notch down on the left side, that means the bass frequencies are getting cut out. So, and because shotgun mics will introduce a lot of extra bass frequencies, it's good to have a microphone that can, you can do that with so you don't have to worry about messing with equalization in post-production. What else can I tell you? Don't let the batteries die. The th the Very exactly. Especially with lav mics, because what they'll do is, as they're dying, they'll get a little bit crunchy, but only for like a minute or so, and then it's gone. So the thing to be able to watch is, you know, especially if you're going to be doing an important interview, put new batteries into the lav, both the transmitter and the receiver. Because if you, you know, last thing you want to do is tell people to wait, I got to change the batteries on your microphone. It, you know, anything that blows the flow of whatever it is you're doing is, is not going to be conducive to a, a great shoot. So one thing, I, again, what I would recommend is try out different microphones. Take out the zoom recorder and see what it does. Because one of the, thing, one of the very cool things that it does, in a lot of ways it is. You just got to remember to turn it on when you turn on your camera, you know. But if you got a digital SLR, you're going to think of it anyway because it's the only way to do it. This has a little tripod thread in the back. This is a monopod, which you can get at any camera store for under 20 bucks. And, right, so you get rid of the external microphones. You put on, you know, the... In, you, put on the internal microphone here and then just you know you can do the same thing as you would do with a boom microphone but just you know hold it over their head it's um you can't watch the the meter you know but if you pretty much you know if you've got a, the headphones going through here and you're just listening to what's going on you get a pretty good idea if you've, if you've got audio problems or not because that's a monopod it doesn't have a mono, um, it doesn't have the No, it doesn't. It's just like that. But you don't need it because it's all self-contained. You know, the microphone, the recorder, everything's in one place. The only thing you need to be able to run is the headphones into this jack. And just, yeah, just sort of twirl it around there. The other thing that does a good job of keeping, you know, if you don't have a boom pole that's got the wire built into it is uh, hair ties. I don't know if you've seen them. They're like a rubber band with um, a little plastic, a couple of plastic balls at the end. You wrap those around and it'll just hold it onto the boom pole and it'll never get loose and you won't have to worry about rattling in the wind or anything like that. You can also get a windscreen for this microphone set up here. Um, usually, a, I don't know if, does, this, does the station still have that? Have you seen it around? But pretty much, you know, you can take any kind of relatively porous foam like you know we've got on either of these microphones and just wrap it around. What some people could do is take a wool sock and you know just wrap it around the microphone. You still are cutting the high frequencies that the microphone is going to be able to pick up but it will save you from getting wind. Any other questions? Cable. Yes. What, what of them? Yeah, that's what uh, I'm seeing. Everything is wired. There's no free transmission. No, except for the uh, wireless mics. Now, what you can do in some situations um, on lav mics, the, the microphone itself disconnects. And if you have an adapter that can go from a, you know, the connector for the microphone, the three pin XLR connector, to a um, eighth inch ja uh, you know mini mini jack you can then plug in your shotgun mic to the 
to this and have the receiver on the camera and then you're not tripping over the wire for the guy who's got the whoever's you know running the the boom pole or even with a hand mic like this um, you've probably seen reporters on air that have a microphone like this but it's got a little box at the bottom that's the transmitter so the wire so the you're not physically tied to the camera in in that kind of situation so it really allows for a lot more freedom um, again the problem with wireless mics is if you've got a stray radio signal that's going to interfere with the radio signal of the lavalier mic you can have problems. I was, re I was uh, filming at Children's Hospital a few years ago and I had three different wireless mics and every single one of them had was picking up another frequency of something else in the building either an MRI machine or uh, some, some uh, wireless data transmission or something like that. So even if you bring several with you, be ready to go hardwired every now and then because you're going to have to do that sometimes because it's just a bad environment for radio frequencies. So, but yeah, if you're not in a situation like that and you want to be able to stay free from the camera, you can go all wireless if you want. Keep that in mind. Anything else? I'm here to answer your questions at all times. So um, hopefully we covered you know, a lot of the basics of what you want to be able to do. Again, using this equipment is the best way to be able to figure out what's right for you, what you want to be able to use, um, taking them in, into different situations, into different environments will teach you which microphone to use where and you just, you know, you'll eventually get good at it. One of the things I will add is that if you have the ability to be able to put lavalier mics on on everybody like I had that other picture of What some producers will do, like, you know, including Wicked Tuna, is put lav mics on everybody, hide them, have them running for the day, but also use the shotgun mic on another channel. That way you've got, you're totally covered. You know, you've got every potential source covered. And sometimes that makes all the difference in terms of just having something usable. Because when you're shooting in a documentary kind of situation, you can't control what the next sound is going to be or what someone might be able to say off screen or something like that. Being ready to be able to be flexible and to be able to jump on whatever kind of situation you need to have is really going to make the difference in terms of having a successful shoot or not. So again, getting familiar with the gear and being able to pick the right tool for the right job, sometimes you have to make a decision right there on the, on the spot, is really what's going to make a difference in terms of what your finished product is going to be and how you know hassled you are on location or while you're actually doing your video. So, oh, the other thing I would add: um, everybody who has an iPhone, you know, a, a smartphone, that's an audio recorder. You can either use that, you know, stick it in somebody's face in a pinch. You know, if for some reason the camera has to be far away, but you can get close to whoever it is that's talking. You're in a noisy room. Use your iPhone. Uh, things like Voice Memo and a couple of other apps that come with the phone. Just use that as, as your recording device. And a lot of times, if you, I mean, you've seen news conferences, I'm sure, where reporters are just you know, sticking an iPhone in, in whoever it is that they're doing the interview with. What that does is the same thing as the Zoom. It gives you a chance to be able to you know, be totally wireless, completely mobile, be able to put that in. And also, there are adapters now for the iPhone that, um, well, if you've got an iPhone with a headphone jack, It'll work on that, and actually, some of the new ones will go in the, the whole the uh, the micro thing. Radio Shack, for example, has a splitter, so you, you'll have uh, you'll have the conventional audio headset out, and then the microphone in. Uh, of course, it's a mono. Uh, yes, but in most cases, you're only going to try to get right. one source anyway. The, but again, the 
this thing has automatic gain on it. Right. And you got to remember which direction the audio is. Yeah. Where the cord is going. So yeah. Exactly. Don't don't stick the other end in the into whoever's face it is you're doing. But you know, again, it's the kind of thing that you know in a pinch works out actually pretty good. So know the options that are available to you and um, make the most of them. So um, what environments or equipment is shock absorption more valuable for? Um, anything, well, you know, the more sensitive your microphone, like, like this, uh, the more you want to be able to protect it from, from any kind of, you know, shaking and other, you know, things that will introduce noise. So, you know, a good shock absorber like this, I mean, some microphones, are not that sensitive. Some shotgun mics actually you can just sort of clip directly onto, you know, whatever a hard connection onto the pole. But sometimes that's that's not good enough. So this this number here has shock absorbers built into the clips and also there's another shock absorber here where it connects into the handle. So you've got like two two areas that are protected from, you know, whatever banging around you might end up doing. Sometimes just walking with the microphone is enough to make a thing, you know, make noise. So again, it's knowing, knowing the microphone, knowing the equipment that you're using will make all the difference in the world of what you end up with. And I think that does it. So one thing I would like to announce is next month on the 21st, we're going to be doing a workshop on green screen and it's going to happen at night. We've scheduled this to happen at 7 p.m. So I know you folks are able to be able to make these lunchtime things, but we're going to see how many people we can bring in for a nighttime presentation. It'll run between 7 and 8. We'll just be, get into the basics of using the green screen here in the Cape Ann TV studio and trying out some of the things you can do with it. Hopefully get more people thinking about what they can do with some of the neat tricks you can pull off with a green screen. So tell your friends. We're going to be doing that. We'll have a public announcement on the, web, the website pretty soon. And um, thanks for coming. <laughs>